UFC Vegas 71. These are the full card predictions and the betting breakdown. Main event, Sergey Pavlovich versus Curtis Blades. We're going to talk about each of the matchups on the card. Make sure you guys smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn those post notifications on and make sure to share the video as well. Also note, Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, full UFC Vegas 71 fight companion. You don't want to miss it. Let's start it off with the first fight of the night. We got Batkari Dana versus Brady He Stand. I got a ride with the Brady He Stand side to pull this one off in a bit of an upset. I feel like training with Michael Chiesa, you know the grappling skills are A1. Now, he's 23 years of age, and I'm expecting constant improvements, but we already see with Brady a very good wrestling game, solid chain wrestling style. He can continue to get takedowns. He controls from top position. He's pretty relentless with his game overall. Now, in the stand-up department, yes, he is not to the level of Dana. There's more power on Dana's side. He definitely has some heavy hands, big hook shots that he can land and hurt his opponents. I'd say he's pretty explosive. I feel like Brady's ready for this test, though. I see him getting through it. The improvements that he showed from the Tercios fight to then the Fernie Garcia fight, very evident. I'm excited to see more improvements here. I do think he's coming into his own. And even that Tercios loss, very competitive. I think it could have been, you know, a toss-up decision. And I think Brady Heastan has a much higher ceiling than the guy who won the show in Tercios. You don't have to win the Ultimate Fighter to be the better fighter in the UFC. It got him in the door, and I think very bright future for Brady. He's got to get through a dangerous test here. I think he's going to. I like the relentless wrestling style. I like the top control. I like the fact that he's working with Michael Chiesa, strong in the clinch. And I like the ability also to control back position. He takes backs pretty well. I can see him working on Donna with takedowns in the striking. Even against Fernie, Brady got caught very early. So he needs to mind his P's and Q's. Definitely strike a little bit, but on the safer side, looking to land takedowns and use his strength, which is definitely grappling advantage so I'm going with Brady to pull this one off and I'll say he probably does get it done hard fought decision odds for it plus 143 best value for he stand Batgari minus 150 I'm going dog side I'm going with Brady he stand to win his third fight in the UFC here and really get some momentum going hardest fight of his life 100% but I think constant improvements being made at 23 he's getting better and better and better so quick and he went through the ringer of hell with the ultimate fighter, was in the house, won there, and now he's in the UFC. I think that he's, he's coming through. I know he didn't win the show, but great experience from that, and I expect victory on Saturday. We're going with Brady He stand underdog to start the card off. Next fight, we got the ladies going after it. It's Priscilla Cachuera versus Corinne Silva. I got to pick Corinne Silva in this matchup here. I feel as though she's going to be way better on the floor, which I would say Cachuera's biggest weakness is going to be in the grappling department. Now, she's scrambly and scrappy with her grappling defense, similar to how her striking is, though. She's very scrappy. She likes to bang, a little bit unorthodox, likes to throw pretty much 100% power into 95% of her strikes, whereas Corinne Silva is a more calculated striker, definitely more on the patient Muay Thai side when you have more of the pressure brawler striking style from Cachuera. I mean, the nickname, Zombie girl but I like killer on the other side I think that Corinne Silva is coming to kill the zombie here so I do think Silva subs her you look at Cachuera's losses by submission girl in Corinne Silva who's got a lot of wins by sub I believe seven in her career and a lot straight submission wins got a submission on contender series got a submission um, in her UFC debut and I think she's going to get a submission here over Priscilla Cachuera who I just think technically isn't going to have the same chops as Corinne Silva when they get to the mat. So going to lean the side of Corinne Silva by submission. Now this is not maybe the favorite bet of the night. Definitely not. Odds around the minus 160 range for Corinne Silva. Cachuera at plus 165. I will say this, Cachuera 34. Lately, she's been really coming into her own. Five and what, four and one in the last five, rather, with the loss to Jillian Robertson, which I'd say is extraordinarily forgivable. And she's got impressive W's, but still, competitive fights, even in her matchup with uh, what, Ji Yoon Kim. I thought she deserved to lose that fight. Impressive over Lipsky for sure. 
Look at other wins. Gina Mazzani, Shayna Dobson. These aren't big W's. I would say the most impressive fight throughout it all has got to be the clean knockout of Ariane Lipsky. But that type of occurrence is a rarity. I think Corinne Silva should pull this one off. And I think on the ground has a big advantage. So I'm going to call Corinne Silva to win via submission here. And also with the patient striking, she should find home to some shots. And not get caught by crazy shit. But like I said, she's the favorite around that minus 160 to minus 190 range. Cachuera, big plus money. And I know people like dog side women's MMA. There's plus money on Cachuera, who's a dangerous brawler. But I just think Corinne Silva is uh, the better fighter overall. So going to ride with her to get it done. Let's keep running up the card. Next one. We got Francis Marshall versus William Gomez. I'm going to pick William Gomez here because I don't think Francis Marshall has really fought anybody all that great. Whereas Gomez has been fighting around the world, accruing a ton of experience against pretty decent guys. Francis Marshall, yes, Marcelo Rojo win in the last one. He fought a 5-0 and fighter on the Contender Series. But when you dig into the record of that 5-0 and fighter, he had fought nobody. He now is stepping into a fight versus a hungry prospect who's only a year older than him, 25 versus 24. And Gomez, to me, is clearly the more proficient and technical kickboxer. He has a very nice French kickboxing style. Super slick, good from the outside, nice movement. The question mark is always going to be around, you know, the grappling skills of a French fighter. But Gomez showed a decent ground game, I believe, in his last fight against Jerno Aarons, who was a dangerous guy from that European scene too. Winning cage warriors for Gomez. He's been around for a long time. 11-2 and two is a great record. He's accrued, like I said, a lot of experience. And he fights Francis Marshall, who's heavy with his hands, good pressure fighter, some solid wrestling skills, but maybe a bit reckless. I think Gomez is definitely the better technical striker. So if he can stay off his back for the majority of this fight, I think he's out striking a hungry young fighter like Francis Marshall and giving him his first loss. I got to go veteran savvy. I got to go William Gomez to get it done with the more uh, higher level experience. Looking at the odds, Gomez, surprisingly he's a big dog plus 180 for William Gomez here Francis Marshall sitting around minus 185 the hype is definitely on the Marshall side but Gomez does have some tremendous striking I mean when you look at his game it's smooth it's crisp I like the way he's moving whereas his opponent on the other side intense flurries and fast combinations but not nearly as technical and definitely not as proficient from the longer ranges so we got to ride with Gomez to get that hand raised I say he gets it done I like his kicks too he's a southpaw there's a lot of things to really like with the striking of Gomez I'll go decision win William Gomez prospect prospect going after it so let's see who wins the battle of him next fight on the card we got Mohamed Uzman versus Junior Tafa it's crazy to see. This is Justin Taffa's brother who has a lot of kickboxing experience fighting Usman's brother who's a tough and strong, heavy-handed MMA fighter, but I never feel like he's that great. So I'm going to go with the side of Junior Taffa, but Mohamed Usman hits really hard. I worry about Taffa getting way too reckless and caught with a big punch. I mean, he's 4-0 and as an MMA fighter, 20-5 and in professional kickboxing. But he's fighting Usman's brother. I think Mohamed Usman, intelligent side of him would be, let me try to take this guy to the floor. But I also think Mohamed Usman's hittable. His chin comes up a bit high. He was a big dog against Zach Pauga, who I knew he got the win against. And Pauga turned out to not be all that great, barely beating you know, Jordan Wright after that. But I think Tafa's stand-up could be it. I'm going to fall into the hype. I'm going to believe that he pulls this one off. I'm going to say it's a knockout, but I'll also say this. I think under two and a half rounds, fight ends inside of the distance. Those are like lock picks for this matchup. I'll pick Junior Taffa to win by KO, though, but it is a very fucking dangerous fight. And I do think there's a possibility that he gets overly confident with his kickboxing game. He gets crazy out there and he gets caught with a big punch. I'm acknowledging that. But ultimately, I do believe he finds home to big strikes and hurts Usman. Because from what I saw of Junior Taffa, Good knockout power in the hands, nasty overhands, pretty quick for a heavyweight as well and moves nicely, but his game is definitely pressure forward and go for the KO. You can run into some heat with these four-ounce gloves. I like the matchup. I think it's going to be a fun fight. I'm going to say that Tafa pulls it off, but Mohamed Usman's not an easy guy to beat. I do think Tafa slips an overhand through the guard and flattens him. I'm going to say KO for Junior Tafa. 
fucking crazy fight here between these two. The lines for this one are blowing my mind because I'm seeing even money at bet online, minus 110 both sides. But I'm seeing at my bookie that Mohamed Usman is plus 186. That's a head scratcher. That makes zero sense to me. This is a pick'em's fight for sure. Coin flip matchup. Somebody who gets hit hard first probably goes down. I'm going to ride with the kickboxer's side, but ultimately it doesn't guarantee success against MMA fighters just because you were a good kickboxer. I mean, look at even Azamat Mirzakhanov last week fucking up Dustin Jacoby, the former glory kickboxer. Look at Khalil Roundtree sleeping Gohan Saki. So just being a kickboxer doesn't mean you're going to knock out these MMA fighters. Because MMA fighters can definitely strike. And the small gloves is their forte. Tafa's got some nice wins. I'll ride with the KO side. I'll say he catches Mohamed Usman. But I definitely believe it is not an easy fight. Not an easy fight at all. Let's keep running up. Next fight on the card. We got Carl Rosa versus Norma Dumont. I'm going Carl Rosa here. I am never all that impressed with Norma Dumont. She fights with like a karate kickboxing striking style, whereas Corinne Silva, I think, is much more precise with her boxing game. You look at the Sarah McMahon loss, and you're like, oh, Carol Rosa can't wrestle. Okay, chill. It's Sarah McMahon. She's extremely high level on the wrestling. Carol Rosa can wrestle. Carol Rosa could take a Norma Dumont down. In the striking, Carol Rosa definitely has her beat. In the grappling, I see it being fairly competitive. I'm not sold on Norma Dumont. I know people uh, are all over the Norma Dumont side. I saw that a lot of people on Tapology picking her. I don't see it. I'm never impressed by Norma Dumont. On the opposite side, Carol Rosa looks pretty good with her game. She's got slick double legs. Like, yeah, she lost to a great wrestler in the wrestling department in a fight that was always on the floor. But Norma Dumont's not that. Norma Dumont just won a competitive decision over a girl who was 1-0 in Danielle Wolf. Carol Rosa, 16-4, been around this game for a while. And not to mention, she's also younger than Norma Dumont. Carol Rosa, she's getting it done. Unanimous decision. She's going to work, Norma. Odds are close. I'm seeing Rosa as an ever-so-slight dog here at BetOnline. Minus 105, Rosa. Minus 115, Norma Dumont. Give me the Corral Rosa side all day. Unanimous decision win. Touches her up with straight punches. And I think maybe even puts Norma Dumont on her ass and beats her up a bit from the top position. We're going with Rosa by a clean decision. Next fight on the card. We got Ronnie Yaya versus Montel Jackson. The pick here is Montel Jackson. And I would say this is like one of those... No brainer picks because if you look at the matchup, you got Yaya, who's a good jujitsu practitioner and also 38. You have Montel Jackson, who's a good wrestler, southpaw, long as fuck, big reach advantage. I'm going to say Montel Jackson sleeps Ronnie Yaya, maybe TKOs him, but I do think the striking of Montel Jackson is going to land because of his grappling skill set and I think the ability to not even be close to taken down by Ronnie Yaya. Who dictates this fight where it's at? It's definitely Montel. If they want to strike, if Montel wants to strike, they strike him. If Montel wants it on the floor, he can land takedowns. I think he can work cage pressure. I know he's going to realize the dangerous jiu-jitsu skill set that is across from him in Ronnie Yaya. But in the striking department, Yaya is super mid. Whereas Montel Jackson's pretty good. Quick. He's quick. He's got decent straights down the line, and I think that if he's keeping it up, he's popping straight shots, he's touching up Ronnie Yaya, I think he can eventually get a stoppage. I'm thinking like maybe second round knockout, maybe he drops some of them ground and pound TKO, probably works a little bit of cage wrestling, but maybe even doesn't commit to getting takedowns, but just gets control inside of the clinch to accrue some control time, tire out Ronnie Yaya a bit, but dude, in the striking, he doesn't even need to really tire him out, he can just outstrike him all night. Montel Jackson, I think, is going to knock Ronnie Yaya out. So we're going Montel. Obviously, it's a confident pick. He's minus 550 as the favorite, though, plus 420 for Yaya. I wonder what the knockout prop is going to look like. That would be something maybe to think about, a KO prop. Because I think Montel Jackson, you know, a guy not really known for his knockouts, this matchup here is one where he could get a KO. So I'm going to go Montel Jackson. I'm going to say he does win by a KO against the jiu-jitsu ace, Ronnie Yaya. I think it's one-way traffic. I don't think this fight's close at all. Yeah, he's got good jujitsu, but at 38, he's not ready for Montel Jackson's well-rounded game. And Montel's a southpaw. Straight shots are landing down the line. Next fight, it brings us to the featured 
prelim of the night. It's Ricky Glenn versus Christos Yagos. Let me tell you, this pick is going to be Ricky Glenn. But I acknowledge that Yagos is not an easy guy to beat. And Ricky Glenn, I mean, look at his fights recently, okay? 25 seconds, he beats Silva. And then he loses, or I guess he draws Grant Dawson in a fight that he was definitely losing. He got destroyed in the first two rounds, and he had a dominant third round. And then you look on the opposite side, Yagos loses to Thiago Moises, top caliber, top 20 lightweight in the world. Armand Sarukian, top eight lightweight in the world. Sean Soriano, Carl Timinas, lost to Jakar Close. So Yagos has been in there with some savages as of late, whereas Ricky Glenn, off for a long time, comes back and, you know, does some work later in his fight. How do I like Ricky Glenn to win? I think in the stand-up department, he's got a good edge. He can outstrike a Yagos. I do think Yagos is physically stronger than him. And in the grappling department, I'm very interested to see how they match up because I've always considered Ricky Glenn to be a pretty strong grappler too, though. Whereas Yagos, I think, is a little more explosive and quick on the mat. He has some submission skills. I think Ricky Glenn wins a hard-fought decision in this matchup here, but... I don't like the odds at all because Ricky Glenn's a big favorite. He's minus 190. Yago's at like plus 170. I don't think Rick Glenn's two to one. I think this is a closer line than that because Ricky Glenn's been inconsistent. I mean, he took so many years off the Kevin Aguilar fight. Now, he's looked good since coming back, so I'm going to ride with the momentum that Ricky Glenn has coming into this fight, winning that third round against a real contender in Grant Dawson who's on the come up. So we'll go Ricky Glenn to win, but I do believe that the line is a little bit wide. I think he beats Yagos in a hard-fought fight, win by unanimous decision, and uh, Ricky Glenn striking, it's not like crazy, dangerous, and powerful, but he does land sneaky straights through the guard, man. Stiff left hand, bit of power. I think he could stun Yagos. Ultimately, I see three competitive rounds, whereas Ricky Glenn, he's going to edge it out at the end of it. So Ricky Glenn to win. I'm saying he's getting a decision in an interesting featured prelim of the night. Next fight brings us to the main card. If you guys haven't, make sure you smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. Jeremiah Wells, Matt Selmelsberger. I'm picking the side of Jeremiah Wells to get the KO. And I understand people... Or like, yo, Selma's burger, what if he takes the shots and he goes longer? The power that Jeremiah Wells generates is fucking mind-boggling to me. He can load up, rip, but there's so much sting on it and speed, like you don't even see the shit coming. You can't make any little mistake. Look at Matt Selmersberger getting cut with overhands against Alex Morono. If Jeremiah Wells hits you with that same punch, you are not getting up. The power that Jeremiah Wells generates is out of this world. Oh, but Matt Somersberger went long with Chaos Williams. Chaos Williams' punching power is overrated. It is overrated, 100%. We found that out in later fights for Chaos. Jeremiah Wells has the power that we thought Chaos Williams has. And that is destroying power. Like, just life-changing knockout power. I think Jeremiah Wells is continuing a knockout streak. Somersberger is good. I really think he's a good fighter. He's slick with his kickboxing, but you look at the explosiveness difference, it's vast. I think Jeremiah Wells is going to put Semmelsberger out in this fight. Give him a bad loss, knockout win, Jeremiah Wells. And and it's really now or never for Jeremiah. 11-2-1, 36. Hasn't taken a lot of damage throughout his career, which is a big positive accolade to have because he, you know, doesn't have a ton of fights for a guy who's 36 years of age. His explosiveness is crazy. He closes distance fucking wildly. Jeremiah Wells is a bit of a freak. I would say he's one of those specimens that if he gets another knockout here, like we gotta, you gotta give him a big fight soon. Philadelphia guy as well. So you know Paul Felder's all over him. Paul Felder's a big fan. Super fast twitch. I think he beat Selmelsberger. I like Selmelsberger's boxing. I like the kickboxing, rather, I would say. Good straight down the line, solid jab, nice low kicks. He's patient, and he finds his openings, whereas Jeremiah Wells, he just creates the openings, and he's going to land. I'm going Jeremiah Wells by KO. He's knocking Selmelsberger unconscious here. Selmelsberger is a slight dog at around plus 110, plus 112. Jeremiah Wells, slight favorite, sitting around that minus 130, minus 140 range. Give me the knockout side for Jeremiah Wells. I see him sleeping Selmelsberger, and I think this fight's going that under two and a half rounds. Maybe an under one and a half between these savages. Great fight. 
Great way to start the main card. Next fight, Lasmin Lucindo versus Brogdon Walker. I'm picking Brogdon Walker to win. What? You're picking Brogdon Walker? She sucks. Hold on for a second before you say Brogdon Walker sucks. When you look at some of her fights outside of the UFC, she's got decent competition level. She's been in there with Aaron Blanchfield and went long. She's a strong girl. Yes, she lost badly to Juliana Miller, who looked pretty bad against Veronica Hardy. She's dropping down to 115 for this fight. Lucindo has not really beaten anybody. I mean, not that long ago, she's fighting in Samurai Fight House. And you know how fighters from Samurai Fight House are doing when they come over to the UFC. Now, granted, Lucindo was awesome in her debut against Yasmin Yeraigoy. But who has Yeraigoy beaten? She's a young 20-something-year-old prospect. Brogdon Walker is a vet of the game with a very strong grappling skill set. She has a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I do think Lucindo's ground skills look solid in some of her tape against lower level girls, but this is Brogdon Walker. What I like about Brogdon Walker, she'll come in with her kind of awkward striking. The chin is a bit high. It doesn't look good. But what she does is she'll look to clinch up. She actually has a good head and arm clinch and then a throw from there. She's strong, just taking you to the floor. I think she's going to have a strength advantage, a grappling advantage, wrestling advantage here. In the striking, Lucindo all day long. If they're forced to strike, Lucindo is going to be touching her up. But I think Brogdon Walker is a super live underdog here because Lucindo is kind of reckless brawler striking style, which kind of works really well for wrestlers to take her down. I think that Brogdon Walker gets her to the floor, and I think Brogdon Walker is going to win by submission. At 115, Brogdon is going to be dangerous. And let's not forget, she still won two fights up a weight class on the Ultimate Fighter at 125. She's got a ton of experience, 7-3 and three record, right? But really, she's 9-3, and three, ton of fights. You see a lot of losses as of recent. Yeah, Lucindo, I guess, does have more fights overall, but she's 21. She started fighting at like 14 years of age. Brogdon Walker's been fighting on that Invicta circuit against some savages, Pearl Gonzalez. Like I said, Aaron Blanchfield. I mean, come on, look, look at the last few. Juliana Miller loss, it is what it is. Emily King's not a great 5-5 five and five girl, but still, you got some names there. Win over Miranda Maverick, let's not forget about that. Let's not forget about that. I think Brogdon Walker's winning by submission. I think she's a super live underdog. I think this is a bad matchup for Lucindo, who's 21. And everybody's going to be sleeping on Brogdon Walker besides me. Plus 250, Brogdon Walker. Give me the dog. Lucindo, minus 300. She doesn't deserve to be 3-1. to one. It makes zero sense. This is the finalist from the Ultimate Fighter versus Lucindo, who, in my opinion, a bit reckless. Prove that in her debut. Fun fighter. Also, ground skills, super suspect. Has submission losses, too. We're going Brogdon Walker for the win. And I'm going to say she's getting it done via submission. Upset, baby. Upset city. Next fight on the card. Bobby Green, Jared Gordon. I'm picking Bobby Green. He's way too slick and smooth with the stand-up. And his wrestling defense is always pretty solid. I see him popping Jared Gordon with straights. I see Gordon trying to close that gap and use his big hooks. He likes that high guard style. I expect Jared Gordon to look to wrestle. I do think Bobby Green fends off takedowns pretty well. And I think Bobby's winning a unanimous decision in this fight. Clean. Three rounds, more significant strikes landed. He touches up Gordon a bit. I'm not going to fall into the trap of thinking Bobby Green's knocking Jared Gordon out because Bobby Green rarely knocks anybody out. I know the Ally Aquinta fight was different, and I know he was landing real big shots um, even in his last fight, which, let's be honest, bro. Let's be honest. Drew Dober will take seven to land one, and then he gets the knockout win. I think Bobby Green... Wins a unanimous decision with high volume here. Looks slick, hands are low, touching up Gordon from distance. Gordon trying to bring that pressure, but just not enough of the boxing chops really and doesn't have that dominating wrestling game that it takes to really neutralize a Bobby Green. And if they're striking, it's Bobby Green all day. Unanimous decision, Bobby Green for the win. He gets back in the W column. He needs it. Minus 250, Bobby Green. Jared Gordon at plus 230. I like the Bobby Green side. I like unanimous decision. I know Jared Gordon is hoping for a win here, and then maybe him and Patty the Batty can run it back. Patty the Fatty. He probably should have won that decision against Patty Pimble. Let's be honest. Let's be real. I know. We all know. But then they throw you Bobby Green, which is a nightmare matchup. Patty Pimble does not want a part of Bobby Green. I'll tell you that much. Bobby Green would touch him up. And Bobby Green's going to touch up Jared Gordon on fight night. So we're going Bobby Green, unanimous decision. Next fight, it's the featured bout of the night. It's Brad Tavares 
versus Bruno Silva. Isn't it crazy at one point, like, Bruno Silva was that Brazilian savage on the come-up, and then he got dropped by Gerald Mearshart. I got to pick Brad Tavares. Tavares, like... Look good, I would say, against Dracus Duplessis. He had big moments in that fight. His stand-up is pretty solid. He's a well-rounded fighter. Good top control. Good skills everywhere. That's Brad Tavares. He's a good generalist. Bruno Silva, dangerous Muay Thai. I say it's pretty decent. And, you know, people are going to be riding high with his performance against, you know, Alex Pereira, which I get it. It was fairly impressive. He looked good in that fight. But then you follow it up getting dropped by Gerald Mearshart. I just don't think Bruno Silva is that good. He shoots very wide punches, and I think there's a lot of counter opportunities. I think Brad Tavares also is going to have a big advantage in the ground department. I think potentially with a takedown, potentially with cage control. I think hard-fought, unanimous decision win for Brad Tavares over Bruno Silva, in my opinion, is highly likely in this fight right here. So we're going with Brad Tavares to win. He is the favorite in this fight by a bit. Around minus 150, Bruno Silva at plus 140. Silva does got some nice body kicks. Like, I'm not taking anything away from him. I know the Gerald Mearshart loss sucks, but they're still giving him a big chance against Brad Tavares, which is kind of crazy because you lose to Gerald Mearshart, and now you get a bigger fight in Brad Tavares. So I guess if Bruno wins, he'd be kind of back towards nearing that top 15 mix. I just don't see it. I think Brad Tavares is better overall. I think Brad Tavares gets a unanimous decision win. He's pretty consistent. Even when he takes losses, he always looks pretty good. I'm expecting three hard rounds from him and a hard-fought decision win. So we're going with Brad. Next fight is the co-main event. Song Yedong versus Ricky Simone. I'm picking Ricky Simone. I like his wrestling. We saw the Kung Fu kid, Song Yedong, on his back a bit. Against a very improved grappler in Corey Sanhagen. But that's telling to me. Because Ricky Simone has that tight striking style with tremendous head movement. He shoots good one-twos. He mixes in his takedowns very quickly. He's explosive. He rips to the body nicely. Good cage pressure. Win over Marab, which is a huge W. Song Yudong on the other side. Super explosive in his striking. Knockout power 100%. Closes the gap really nicely between his big shots. Nice overhand, too, but against guys that are just going to be willing to strike with him. When you now mix in grappling, Ricky Simone's got crazy pace, and he's got the chain wrestling. I see Ricky Simone putting pressure on Song, and I see Ricky Simone having some success with takedowns here. Competitive, three rounds, hard-fought win. Ricky Simone is taking it, and I do think Ricky Simone, 20-3, and three, he's a contender. And it blows my mind that somehow Song Yedong is only 25. I feel like he's been around for so long at this point. It's just crazy how young he got into the game. 19-7-1, and he's 25. He's fought plenty of the top guys. Cheeto Vera comes to mind. Fucking, like I said, fucking last fight. Corey Sanhagen. Look, look at the last five. Kyler Phillips lost. Casey Kenny split. Arce, Marais. You look at the last five for Simone, Ray Borg. That's actually a big win in my opinion. Perillo, eh. Brian Kelleher, eh. A Sun South, big W. Jack Shore, huge win. Ricky Simone should win this fight, man. Big grappling advantage. And I think the wrestling's on display. I'll say he gets a unanimous decision, though. I respect the overall game of Song. And he was very tough in that fight against Sanhag. And ultimately, he'll tough out a hard one. And they go the full three with Ricky Simone, hand raised at the end of it by a unanimous decision. And the wrestling takes all. Minus 140, Ricky Simone. Plus 120, Song Yudong. And me saying the wrestling takes all, it doesn't mean that Ricky can't strike with him. I think Ricky could dig to the body a bit. I like the way he moves his head. I got to go with Team Mullet. We're going with Ricky Simone for the victory. Let's jump to the main event of the evening. If you guys haven't, make sure you smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. Sergey Pavlovich versus Curtis Blades. I'm picking Sergey Pavlovich, the Russian Express, to end Curtis Blades on Saturday night. Curtis is a great wrestler and actually a pretty competent striker too. What I see here from Pavlovich is a guy who at 26 years of age was undefeated and thrown into the octagon against Alistair Overeem. 26 and you're fighting Overeem? It's pretty crazy. Since then, he took a long layoff. He came back, and he looked better than ever before, knocking out every one of his opponents after that fight by first-round knockout. 
Yes, we haven't seen him go long, but we've also seen crazy knockout power, great striking from fucking range. He's got awesome straight shots that he'll shoot down the line. He's a pretty A1 boxer for MMA. 14 KO wins. 14 KO wins. The power is off the fucking charts. There's a huge right hand that he throws. He rips the overhand with that right too. Looking at Curtis Blades, like I said, I do think he's got some solid stand-up. Good head movement. will do some dips, which will, you know, kind of make your opponent think, oh, is he going to shoot? Which maybe can set some shots up for him. But if he gets touched with one big one, he could go out. Pavlovich has that earth-shattering power. He might have the heaviest punch on the planet in MMA right now. I wish we could have seen Pavlovich versus Nganu, especially if Pavlovich runs through blades the way I'm seeing it. I think Pavlovich is going to get him out of there in the first round. Look at something. Interesting note, 6'3 to 6'4. Four-inch reach advantage for Pavlovich. I'm telling you, that is going to come into fruition here with their striking. When they're boxing, that jab of Pavlovich works from range. He finds follow-ups, and I really think that he's going to knock out Curtis Blades. I understand. Curtis Blades has great wrestling. He can chain wrestle. He can pressure with it. But when Pavlovich touches you up and he starts pushing you backwards, I think Blades is in trouble. I think Blades is in big trouble. And let's, yes, the Overeem fight, he got ground and pounded, sure. That was many, many, many years ago. Like I said, he was a 26-year-old at that time. Now, about to be 31. Five years, a lot of grappling improvement that can be made. Eagles MMA team. I trust in the defense of the grappling here for Pavlovich. I think that that was a nerve-wracking debut. They throw you Overeem in your debut fight in the UFC. Who did Curtis Blades fight in his debut? Let's see who Curtis Blades fought in his debut because now I'm curious. Curtis Blades, UFC debut. Okay, he fought oh, fucking Nganu. That's crazy. All right. Well, that's interesting. I totally forgot that he fought Nganu in the debut. I guess both guys fought straight killers in their debuts. But at least it wasn't a proven killer yet. For Curtis Blades, I mean, he fought the fucking Mac over him. Granted, over him had lost and shit to like Blades and stuff around that time. And you could see the fucking ground and pound from over him was relentless in that fight. I think Pavlovich wins it, man. Great win streak for him. He's running through all opposition. And I think he finds home to killer shots and knocks Curtis unconscious, man. I trust in the Russian Express. I really think that uh, he's the next one up. Good title challenger, too. Can you imagine? John Jones beats Stipe, Pavlovich beats Blades, Pavlovich versus John Jones, a true crazy test for John Jones, a guy who will match him with his reach, that's a huge fight, that's a Russian versus an American, that's a massive pay-per-view, odds for the fight, plus 145, Pavlovich, minus 155, Curtis Blades, I'm going dog money in the main event. I'm going knockout win for Sergey Pavlovich. And I'm kind of thinking it's first round. I think he continues the trend. First round KO. Beats Curtis Blades. Epic fashion. Epic main event. Epic card. And I think some epic picks. I feel like I really brought the heat this week. I'm super excited to see how all these fights play out. I hope you guys enjoyed the full card breakdown. Make sure you smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. Riding high after last week. Hitting it with Max Holloway. Hitting it with Edson Barboza. Some good other picks through the card. 9-5 and five last week. We're looking to continue here into this week with uh, some straight fire. I'll be dropping content every single day, so make sure you guys have those post notifications turned on. Much love to everybody watching. Definitely know. Let me know. Your main event pick in the comments, and if you have nothing to say in those comments, but you enjoy my content, W in the chat as always. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace, guys.